Chapter 17 of English Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Allison, Virginia. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. .tumblr.com. English Fairy Tales by Flora Annie Steele. Chapter 17 Catskin. Once upon a time there lived a gentleman who owned fine lands and houses, and he very much wanted to have a son to be heir to them. So when his wife brought him a daughter, though she was bonny as bonny could be, he cared not for her, and said, Let me never see her face. So she grew up to be a beautiful maiden, though her father never set eyes on her till she was fifteen years old and was ready to be married. Then her father said roughly, She shall marry the first that comes for her. Now when this became known, who should come along and be first but a nasty, horrid old man? So she didn't know what to do, and went to the henwife and asked her advice. And the henwife said, Say you will not take him unless they give you a coat of silver cloth. Well, they gave her a coat of silver cloth, but she wouldn't take him for all that, but went again to the henwife, who said, Say you will not take him unless they give you a coat of beaten gold. Well, they gave her a coat of beaten gold, but still she would not take the old man, but went again to the henwife, who said, Say you will not take him unless they give you a coat made of the feathers of all the birds of the air. So they sent out a man with a great heap of peas, and the man cried to all the birds of the air, Each bird take a pea and put down a feather. So each bird took a pea and put down one of its feathers. And they took all the feathers and made a coat of them and gave it to her, but still she would not take the nasty, horrid old man, but asked the henwife once again what she was to do. And the henwife said, Say they must first make you a coat of catskin. Then they made her a coat of catskin, and she put it on, and tied up her other coats into a bundle, and when it was night time, ran away with it into the woods. Now she went along, and went along, and went along, till at the end of the wood she saw a fine castle. Then she hid her fine dresses by a crystal waterfall, and went up to the castle gates and asked for work. The lady of the castle saw her, and told her, I'm sorry I have no better place, but if you like, you may be our scullion. So down she went into the kitchen, and they called her Catskin because of her dress. But the cook was very cruel to her, and led her a sad life. Well, soon after that, it happened that the young lord of the castle came home, and there was to be a grand ball in honor of the occasion. And when they were speaking about it among the servants, "'Dear me, Mrs. Cook,' said Catskin, "'how much I should like to go!' "'What, you dirty, impudent slut,' said the cook, "'you go among all the fine lords and ladies with your filthy Catskin? A fine figure you'd cut!' And with that she took a basin of water and dashed it into Catskin's face. But Catskin only shook her ears and said nothing. Now when the day of the ball arrived, Catskin slipped out of the house and went to the edge of the forest where she had hidden her dresses. Then she bathed herself in a crystal waterfall and put on her coat of silver cloth and hastened away to the ball. As soon as she entered, all were overcome by her beauty and grace, while the young lord at once lost his heart to her. He asked her to be his partner for the first dance, and he would dance with none other the live-long night. When it came to parting time, the young lord said, "'Pray tell me, fair maid, where you live?' But Catskin curtsied and said, "'Kind sir, if the truth I must tell, at the sign of the basin of water I dwell.' Then she flew from the castle and donned her catskin robe again, and slipped into the scullery, unbeknown to the cook. The young lord went the very next day and searched for the sign of the basin of water, but he could not find it. So he went to his mother, the lady of the castle, and declared he would wed none other but the lady of the silver dress, and would never rest till he had found her. So another ball was soon arranged in hopes that the beautiful maid would appear again. So Catskin said to the cook, "'Oh, how I should like to go!' Whereupon the cook screamed out in rage, "'What? You, you dirty, impudent slut!' You would cut a fine figure among all the fine lords and ladies. And with that she up with a ladle and broke it across Catskin's back. But Catskin only shook her ears and ran off to the forest where, first of all, she bathed, and then she put on her coat of beaten gold, and off she went to the ballroom. As soon as she entered, all eyes were upon her, 
and the young lord at once recognized her as the lady of the basin of water claimed her hand for the first dance and did not leave her to the last when that came he again asked her where she lived but all that she would say was kind sir if the truth i must tell at the sign of the broken ladle i dwell and with that she curtsied and flew from the ball off with her golden robe on with her catskin and into the scullery without the cook's knowing next day when the young lord could not find where the sign of the broken ladle was he begged his mother to have another grand ball so that he might meet the beautiful maid once more then catskin said to the cook oh how i wish i could go to the ball whereupon the cook called out a fine figure you'd cut and broke the skimmer across her head but catskin only shook her ears and went off to the forest where she first bathed in the crystal spring and then donned her coat of feathers and so off to the ballroom when she entered every one was surprised at so beautiful a face and form dressed in so rich and rare a dress but the young lord at once recognized his beautiful sweetheart and would dance with none but her the whole evening when the ball came to an end he pressed her to tell him where she lived but all she would answer was kind sir if the truth i must tell at the sign of the broken skimmer i dwell and with that she curtsied and was off to the forest but this time the young lord followed her and watched her change her fine dress of feathers for her catskin dress and then he knew her for his own scullery maid next day he went to his mother and told her that he wished to marry the scullery maid catskin never said the lady of the castle never so long as i live while the young lord was so grieved that he took to his bed and was very ill indeed the doctor tried to cure him but he would not take any medicine unless from the hands of catskin at last the doctor went to the mother and said that her son would die if she did not consent to his marriage with catskin so she had to give way then she summoned catskin to her and catskin put on her coat of beaten gold before she went to see the lady and she of course was overcome at once and was only too glad to wed her son to so beautiful a maid so they were married and after a time a little son was born to them and grew up a fine little lad now one day when he was about four years old a beggar woman came to the door and lady catskin gave some money to the little lord and told him to go and give it to the beggar woman so he went and gave it putting it into the hand of the woman's baby child and the child leaned forward and kissed the little lord now the wicked old cook who had never been sent away because catskin was too kind-hearted was looking on and she said see how beggars brats take to one another this insult hurt catskin dreadfully and she went to her husband the young lord and told him all about her father and begged he would go and find out what had become of her parents so they set out in the lord's grand coach and travelled through the forest till they came to the house of catskin's father then they put up at an inn near and catskin stopped there while her husband went to see if her father would own she was his daughter now her father had never had any other child and his wife had died so he was all alone in the world and sate moping and miserable when the young lord came in he hardly looked up he was so miserable then catskin's husband drew a chair close up to him and asked him pray sir had you not once a young daughter whom you would never see or own and the miserable man said with tears it is true i am a hardened sinner but i would give all my worldly goods if i could but see her once before i die then the young lord told him what had happened to catskin and took him to the inn and afterwards brought his father-in-law to his own castle where they lived happy ever afterwards end of chapter 17 catskin recording by alice in virginia we are fearfully and wonderfully made .tumblr .com. chapter 18 of english fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org english fairy tales by flora annie steele chapter 18 the three little pigs once upon a time there was an old sow who had three little pigs and as she had not enough for them to eat she said they had better go out into the world and seek their fortunes now the eldest pig went first and as he trotted along the road he met a man carrying a bundle of straw so he said very politely if you please sir could you give me that straw to build me a house and the man 
seeing what good manners the little pig had gave him the straw and the little pig set to work and built a beautiful house with it now when it was finished a wolf happened to pass that way and he saw the house and he smelt the pig inside so he knocked at the door and said little pig little pig let me in let me in but the little pig saw the wolf's big paws through the keyhole so he answered back no 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 by the hair of my chinny chin chin then the wolf showed his teeth and said then i'll huff and i'll puff and i'll blow your house in so he huffed and he puffed and he blew the house in then he ate up little piggy and went on his way now the next piggy when he started met a man carrying a bundle of furs and being very polite he said to him if you please sir could you give me that furs to build me a house and the man seeing what good manners the little pig had gave him the furs and the little pig set to work and built himself a beautiful house now it so happened that when the house was finished the wolf passed that way and he saw the house and he smelt the pig inside so he knocked at the door and said little pig little pig let me in let me in but the little pig peeped through the keyhole and saw the wolf's great ears so he answered back no 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 by the hair of my chinny chin chin then the wolf showed his teeth and said then i'll huff and i'll puff and i'll blow your house in so he huffed and he puffed and he blew the house in then he ate up little piggy and went on his way now the third piggy when he started met a man carrying a load of bricks and being very polite he said if you please sir could you give me those bricks to build me a house and the man seeing that he had been well brought up gave him the bricks and the little pig set to work and built himself a beautiful house and once again it happened that when it was finished the wolf chanced to come that way and he saw the house and he smelt the pig inside so he knocked at the door and said little pig little pig let me in let me in but the little pig peeped through the keyhole and saw the wolf's great eyes so he answered no 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 by the hair of my chinny chin chin then i'll huff and i'll puff and i'll blow your house in says the wolf showing his teeth well he huffed and he puffed he puffed and he huffed and he huffed huffed and he puffed puffed but he could not blow the house down at last he was so out of breath that he couldn't huff and he couldn't puff any more so he thought a bit then he said little pig i know where there is ever such a nice field of turnips do you says little piggy and where may that be i'll show you says the wolf if you will be ready at six o'clock to-morrow morning and i will call around for you and we can go together to farmer smith's field and get turnips for dinner thank you kindly says little piggy i will be ready at six o'clock sharp but you see the little pig was not one to be taken in with chaff so he got up at five trotted off to farmer smith's field rooted up the turnips and was home eating them for breakfast when the wolf clattered at the door and cried little pig little pig are you ready says the little piggy why what a sluggard you are i have been to the field and come back again and i'm having a nice potful of turnips for breakfast then the wolf grew red with rage but he was determined to eat little piggy so he said as if he didn't care i'm glad you like them but i know of something better than turnips indeed says little piggy and what may that be a nice apple tree down in merry gardens with the juiciest sweetest apples on it so if you will be ready at five o'clock to-morrow morning i will come round for you and we can get the apples together thank you kindly says little piggy i will sure and be ready at five o'clock sharp now the next morning he bustled up ever so early 
and it wasn't four o'clock when he started to get the apples but you see the wolf had been taken in once and wasn't going to be taken in again so he also started at four o'clock and the little pig had just got his basket half full of apples when he saw the wolf coming down the road licking his lips hello says the wolf here already you are an early bird are the apples nice very nice says little piggy i'll throw you down one to try and he threw it so far away that when the wolf had gone to pick it up the little pig was able to jump down with his basket and run home well the wolf was fair angry but he went next day to little piggy's house and called through the door as mild as milk little pig little pig you are so clever i should like to give you a fairing so if you will come with me to the fair this afternoon you shall have one thank you kindly says little piggy what time shall we start at three o'clock sharp says the wolf so be sure to be ready i'll be ready before three sniggered the little piggy and he was he started early in the morning and went to the fair and rode in the swing and enjoyed himself ever so much and brought himself a butter churn as a fairing and trotted away towards home long before three o'clock but just as he got to the top of the hill what should he see but the wolf coming up to it all panting and red with rage well there was no place to hide in but the butter churn so he crept into it and was just pulling down the cover when the churn started to roll down the hill bumpity bumpity bump of course piggy inside began to squeal and when the wolf heard the noise and saw the butter churn rolling down on top of him bumpity bumpity bump he was so frightened that he turned tail and ran away but he was still determined to get the little pig for his dinner so he went next day to the house and told little pig how sorry he was not to have been able to keep his promise of going to the fair because of an awful dreadful terrible thing that had rushed at him making a fearsome noise dear me says the little piggy that must have been me i hid inside the butter churn when i saw you coming and it started to roll i am sorry i frightened you but this was too much the wolf danced about with rage and swore he would come down the chimney and eat up the little pig for his supper but while he was climbing on to the roof the little pig made up a blazing fire and put on a big pot full of water to boil then just as the wolf was coming down the chimney the little piggy off with the lid and plump in fell the wolf into the scalding water so the little piggy put on the cover again boiled the wolf up and ate him for supper end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of english fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by amy mccracken english fairy tales by flora annie steele nix not nothing once upon a time there lived a king and a queen who didn't differ much from all the other kings and queens who have lived since time began but they had no children and this made them very sad indeed now it so happened that the king had to go and fight battles in a far country and he was away for many long months and lo and behold while he was away the queen at long last bore him a little son and as you may imagine she was fair delighted and thought how pleased the king would be when he came home and found that his dearest wish had been fulfilled and all the courtiers were fine and pleased too and set about at once to arrange a grand festival for the naming of the little prince but the queen said no the child shall have no name till his father gives it to him till then we will call him nix not nothing because his father knows nothing about him so little prince nix not nothing grew into a strong hardy little lad for his father did not come back for a long time and did not even know that he had a son but at long last he turned his face homewards 
Now on the way he came to a big rushing river, which neither he nor his army could cross, for it was flood time, and the water was full of dangerous whirlpools, where nixies and water wraiths lived, always ready to drown men. So they were stopped, until a huge giant appeared who could take the river, whirlpool and all, in his stride. And he said kindly, I'll carry you all over if you like. Now, though the giant smiled and was very polite, the king knew enough of the ways of giants to think it wiser to have a hard and fast bargain. So he said quite curt, "'What's your pay?' "'Pay?' echoed the giant with a grin. "'What do you take me for? Give me nix not nothing, and I'll do the job with a glad heart.' Now the king felt just a trifle ashamed at the giant's generosity. So he said, "'Certainly, certainly. I'll give you nix not nothing.' and my thanks into the bargain. So the giant carried them safely over the stream and past the whirlpools, and the king hastened homewards. If he was glad to see his dear wife, the queen, you may imagine how he felt when she showed him his young son, tall and strong for his age. "'And what's your name, young sir?' he asked of the child fast clasped in his arms. "'Nix not nothing,' answered the boy. "'That's what they call me till my father gives me a name.' "'Well,' the king nearly dropped the child he was so horrified what have i done he cried i promised to give nix not nothing to the giant who carried us over the whirlpools where the nixies and water wraiths live at this the queen wept and wailed but being a clever woman she thought out a plan whereby to save her son so she said to her husband the king if the giant comes to claim his promise we will give him the henwife's youngest boy she has so many she will not mind if we give her a crown piece and the giant will never know the difference. Now, sure enough, the very next morning the giant appeared to claim Nix not nothing, and they dressed up the henwife's boy in the prince's clothes, and wept and wailed when the giant, fine and satisfied, carried his prize off on his back. But after a while he came to a big stone and sat down to ease his shoulders, and he fell a-dozing. Now, when he woke, he started up in a fluster and called out, "'Hodge, Hodge, on my shoulders! Say, what do you make of the time of day?' And the henwife's little boy replied, "'Time that my mother, the henwife, takes the eggs for the wise queen's breakfast cakes.' Then the giant saw at once the trick that had been played on him, and he threw the henwife's boy on the ground, so that his head hit on the stone and he was killed. Then the giant strode back to the palace in a tower of a temper, and demanded nix not nothing. So this time they dressed up the gardener's boy, and wept and wailed when the giant, fine and satisfied, carried his prize off on his back. Then the same thing happened. The giant grew weary of his burden, and sate down on the big stone to rest. So he fell a-dozing, woke with a start, and called out, "'Hodge, Hodge, on my shoulders! Say, what do you make of the time o' day?' The gardener's boy, and the gardener's boy replied, "'Time that my father the gardener took greens for the wise queen's dinner to cook.' So the giant saw at once that a second trick had been played on him, and became quite mad with rage. He flung the boy from him so that he was killed, and then strode back to the palace where he cried with fury, "'Give me what you promised to give, nix not nothing, or I will destroy you all, root and branch.' So then they saw they must give up the dear little prince, and this time they really wept and wailed as the giant carried off the boy on his back. And this time, after the giant had had his rest at the big stone and had woke up, and called, "'Hodge, Hodge, on my shoulders!' "'Say, what do you make the time o' day?' The little prince replied, "'Time for the king, my father, to call. Let supper be served in the banqueting hall.' Then the giant laughed with glee, and rubbed his hands, saying, "'I've got the right one at last.' So he took Nix not nothing to his own house under the whirlpools, for the giant was really a great magician who could take any form he chose. And the reason he wanted a little prince so badly was that he had lost his wife, and had only one little daughter who needed a playmate sorely. So Nix not nothing and the magician's daughter grew up together, and every year made them fonder and fonder of each other, until she promised to marry him. Now the magician had no notion that his daughter should marry just an ordinary human prince, the like of whom he had eaten a thousand times, so he sought some way in which he would quietly get rid of Nix not nothing So he said one day, I have work for you, Nix not nothing There is a stable hard by which is seven miles long and seven miles broad, and it has not been cleaned for seven years. By tomorrow evening you must have cleaned it, and where I will have you for my supper. Well, before dawn, Nix Not Nothing set to work at his task. 
but as fast as he cleared the muck it just fell back again. So by breakfast time he was in a terrible sweat, yet not one whit nearer the end of his job was he. Now the magician's daughter, coming to bring him his breakfast, found him so distraught and distracted that he could scarce speak to her. "'We'll soon set that to rights,' she said. So she just clapped her hands and called, "'Beasts and birds of each degree, clean me the stable for love of me!' And lo and behold, in a minute the beasts of the fields came trooping, and the sky was just dark with the wings of birds, and they carried away the muck, and the stable was clean as a new pin before the evening. Now when the magician saw this, he grew hot and angry, and he guessed it was his daughter's magic that had wrought the miracle. So he said, Shame on the wit that helped you, but I have a harder job for you tomorrow. Yonder is a lake seven miles long, seven miles broad, and seven miles deep. Drain it by nightfall, so that not one drop remains, or of a certainty I eat you for my supper. So once again Nix not nothing rose before dawn and began his task. But though he bailed out the water without ceasing, it ever ran back, so that though he sweated and labored by breakfast time, he was no nearer the end of his job. But when the magician's daughter came with his breakfast, she only laughed and said, I'll soon mend that. Then she clapped her hands and called, O oh, all ye fish of river and sea, drink me this water for love of me. And lo and behold, the lake was thick with fishes, and they drank and drank till not one drop remained. Now when the magician returned in the morning and saw this, he was as angry as angry, and he knew it was his daughter's magic, so he said, Double shame on the wit that helped you, yet it betters you not, for I will give you yet a harder task than the last. If you do that, you may have my daughter." See you, yonder is a tree seven miles high and no branch to it till the top, and there on the fork is a nest with some eggs in it. Bring those eggs down without breaking one, or sure as fate, I'll eat you for my supper. Then the magician's daughter was very sad, for with all her magic she could think of no way of helping her lover to fetch the eggs and bring them down unbroken. So she sate with Nix Not Nothing underneath the tree, and thought, and thought, and thought until an idea came to her, and she clapped her hands and cried, Fingers of mine for love of me, help my true lover to climb the tree. Then her fingers dropped off her hands one by one, and ranged themselves like the steps of a ladder up the tree. But there was not quite enough for them to reach the top, so she cried again, O oh, toes of mine for love of me, help my true lover to climb the tree. Then her toes began to drop off one by one, and ranged themselves like the rungs of a ladder, but when the toes of one foot had gone to their place, the ladder was tall enough. So Nix Not Nothing climbed up it, reached the nest, and got the seven eggs. Now as he was coming down with the last, he was so overjoyed at having finished his task that he turned to see the magician's daughter was overjoyed too. And lo, the seventh egg slipped from his hand and fell, crash! Quick, quick, cried the magician's daughter, who, as you will observe, always had her wits about her. There is nothing for it now but to fly at once. But first I must have my magic flask, or I shall be unable to help. It is in my room, and the door is locked. Put your fingers, since I have none, in my pocket. Take the key, unlock the door, get the flask, and follow me fast. I shall go slower than you, for I have no toes on one foot. So Nix Not Nothing did as he was bid, and soon caught up the magician's daughter. But alas, they could not run very fast, so ere long the magician— who had once again taken the giant's form in order to have a long stride, could be seen behind them. Nearer and nearer he came, until he was just going to seize Nix Not Nothing, when the magician's daughter cried, Put your finger, since I have none into my hair, take my comb and throw it down. So Nix Not Nothing did as he was bid, and soon caught up the magician's daughter. But alas, they could not run very fast, so ere long the magician, who had once again taken a giant's form in order to have a long stride, could be seen behind them. Nearer and nearer he came, until he was just going to seize Nix Not Nothing, when the magician's daughter cried, Put your finger, since I have none, into my hair. Take my comb and throw it down. So Nix Not Nothing did as he was bid, and lo and behold, out of every one of the comb prongs, there sprang up a prickly briar, which grew so fast that the magician found himself in the middle of a thorn hedge. You may guess how angry and scratched he was before he tore his way out, so Nix Not Nothing and his sweetheart had time for a good start, but the magician's daughter could not run fast because she had lost her toes on one foot. Therefore the magician in giant form soon caught them, and he was just about to grip Nix Not Nothing, 
when the magician's daughter cried, "'Put your fingers, since I have none, to my breast. Take out my veil dagger and throw it down.' So he did as he was bid, and in a moment the dagger had grown to thousands and thousands of sharp razors, crisscross on the ground, and the magician giant was howling with pain as he trod among them. You may guess how he danced and stumbled, and how long it took for him to pick his way through as if he were walking on eggs. So Nix Not Nothing and his sweetheart were nearly out of sight ere the giant could start again. Yet it wasn't long before he was like to catch them up, for the magician's daughter, you see, could not run fast because she had lost her toes on one foot. She did what she could, but it was no use. So just as the giant was reaching out a hand to lay hold of Nix Not Nothing, she cried breathlessly, "'There's nothing left but the magic flask. Take it out and sprinkle some of what it holds on the ground.' And Nix Not Nothing did as he was bid, but in his hurry he nearly emptied the flask altogether. And so the big, big wave of water, which instantly welled up, swept him off his feet, and would have carried him away had not the magician's daughter loosened veil, caught him, and held him fast.' But the wave grew and grew and grew behind them until it reached the giant's waist. Then it grew and grew until it reached his shoulders, and it grew and grew until it swept over his head, a great big sea wave full of little fishes and crabs and sea snails and all sorts of strange creatures. So that was the last of the magician giant. But the poor little magician's daughter was so weary that after a time she couldn't move a step further, and she said to her lover, "'Yonder are lights burning.' Go and see if you can find a night's lodging. I will climb this tree by the pool where I shall be safe, and by the time you return I shall be rested. Now by chance it happened that the lights they saw were the lights of the castle, where Nix Not Nothing's father and mother, the king and queen, lived, though of course he did not know this. So as he walked towards the castle he came upon the henwife's cottage and asked for a night's lodging. Who are you? asked the henwife suspiciously. I am Nix Not Nothing, replied the young man. Now the henwife still grieved over her boy who had been killed, so she instantly resolved to be revenged. I cannot give you a night's lodging, she said, but you shall have a drink of milk, for you look weary. Then you can go on to the castle and beg for a bed there. So she gave him a cup of milk, but being a witch woman, she put a potion in it, so that the very moment he saw his father and mother he should fall fast asleep, and none should be able to waken him. So he would be no use to anybody, and would not recognize his father and mother. Now the king and queen had never ceased grieving for their lost son, so they were always very kind to wandering young men, and when they heard that one was begging a night's lodging, they went down to the hall to see him. And lo, the moment Nix Not Nothing caught sight of his father and mother, there he was on the floor fast asleep, and none could waken him. And he did not recognize his father and mother, and they did not recognize him. But Prince Nix Not Nothing had grown into a very handsome young man, so they pitied him very much, and when none, do what they could, could waken him. The king said, A maiden would likely take more trouble to waken him than others, seeing how handsome he is. So send forth a proclamation that if any maiden in my realm can waken this young man, she shall have him in marriage, and a handsome dowry to boot. So the proclamation was sent forth, and all the pretty maidens of the realm came to try their luck, but they had no success. Now the gardener, whose boy had been killed by the giant, had a daughter, who was very ugly indeed, so ugly that she thought it no use to try her luck, and went about her work as usual. So she took her pitcher to the pool to fill it. Now the magician's daughter was still hiding in the tree, waiting for her lover to return. Thus it came to pass that the gardener's ugly daughter, bending down to fill her pitcher in the pool, saw a beautiful shadow in the water, and thought it was her own. "'If I am as pretty as that,' she cried, "'I'll draw water no longer.' So she threw down her pitcher and went straight to the castle to see if she hadn't a chance of the handsome stranger and the handsome dowry. But of course she hadn't, though at the sight of Nick's not nothing, she fell so much in love with him that, knowing the henwife to be a witch, she went straight to her, and offered all her savings for a charm by which she could awaken the sleeper. Now when the henwife witch heard her tale, she thought it would be a rare revenge to marry the king and queen's long-lost son to a gardener's ugly daughter. So she straightway took the girl's savings, and gave her a charm by which she could unspell the prince, or spell him again at her pleasure. So away went the gardener's daughter to the castle, and sure enough, no sooner had she sung her charm, than Nix Not Nothing awoke. "'I am going to marry you, my charmer,' she said coaxingly. But Nix Not Nothing said he would prefer sleep, so she thought it wiser to put him to sleep again till the marriage feast was ready, and she had got her fine clothes, so she spelled him asleep again." 
Now the gardener had, of course, to draw the water himself, since his daughter would not work. And he took the pitcher to the pool, and he also saw the magician's daughter's shadow in the water. But he did not think the face was his own, for see you, he had a beard. Then he looked up, and saw the lady in the tree. She, poor thing, was half dead with sorrow and hunger and fatigue. So, being a kind man, he took her to his house and gave her food. And he told her that that very day his daughter was to marry a handsome young stranger at the castle, and to get a handsome dowry to boot from the king and queen, in memory of their son Nix Not Nothing, who had been carried off by a giant when he was a little boy. Then the magician's daughter felt sure that something had happened to her lover, so she went to the castle, and there she found him asleep in a chair. But she could not waken him, for see you, her magic had gone from her with the magic flask, which Nix Not Nothing had emptied. So though she put her fingerless hands on his, and wept and sang, I cleaned the stable for love of thee, I laved the lake and clomb the tree, wilt thou not waken for love of me? He never stirred nor woke. Now one of the servants there, seeing how she wept, took pity on her, and said, She that is to marry the young man will be back ere long, and unspell him for the wedding. Hide yourself, and listen to her charm. So the magician's daughter hid herself, and by and by in comes the gardener's daughter in her fine wedding dress, and begins to sing her charm. But the magician's daughter didn't wait for her to finish it. For the moment Nick's not nothing opened his eyes, she rushed out of her hiding place and put her fingerless hands in his. Then Nix Not Nothing remembered everything. He remembered the castle, he remembered his father and mother, he remembered the magician's daughter and all that she had done for him. Then he drew out the magic flask and said, Surely, surely there must be enough magic in it to mend your hands. And there was. There were just fourteen drops left, ten for the fingers and four for the toes. But there was not one for the little toe, so it could not be brought back. Of course, after that, there was great rejoicing, and Prince Nix Not Nothing and the magician's daughter were married and lived happy ever after, even though she only had four toes on one foot. As for the henwife witch, she was burnt, and so the gardener's daughter got back her earnings, but she was not happy, because her shadow in the water was ugly again. End of Nix Not Nothing Recording by Amy McCracken Chapter Twenty of English Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by H. R. Craddock. English Fairy Tales, Chapter Twenty. Mister and Mrs. Vinegar. Mister and Mrs. Vinegar, a worthy couple, lived in a glass pickle jar. The house, though small, was snug, and so light that each speck of dust on the furniture showed like a molehill. So while Mr. Vinegar tilled the garden with his pickle fork and grew vegetables for pickling, Mrs. Vinegar, who was a sharp, bustling, tidy woman, swept, brushed, and dusted, brushed, and dusted, and swept to keep the house clean as a new pin. Now one day she lost her temper with a cobweb and swept so hard after it that bang, bang, the broom handle went right through the glass, and crash, crash, glitter, clatter. There was the pickle jar house about her ears all in splinters and bits. She picked her way over these as best she might and rushed into the garden. Oh, vinegar, vinegar, she cried. We are clean ruin and done for. Quit these vegetables. They won't be wanted. What is the use of pickles if you haven't a pickle jar to put them in? And I've broken ours into little bits. And with that, she fell to crying bitterly. But Mr. Vinegar was a different metal. Though a small man, he was a cheerful one, always looking at the best side of things. So he said, accidents will happen, lovey. But there are as good pickle bottles in the shop as ever came out of it. All we need is money to buy another. So let us go out into the world and seek our fortunes. But what about the furniture? sobbed Mrs. Vinegar. I will take the door of the house with me, lovey, quoth Mr. Vinegar stoutly. Then no one will be able to open it, will they? Mrs. Vinegar did not 
quite see how this fact would mend matters, but being a good wife, she held her peace. So off they trudged into the world to seek fortune, Mr. Vinegar bearing the door on his back like a snail carries its house. Well, they walked all day long, but not a brass farthing did they make. And when night fell, they found themselves in a dark, thick forest. Now, Mrs. Vinegar, for all she was a smart, strong woman, was tired to death and filled with fear of wild beasts. So she began once more to cry bitterly. But Mr. Vinegar was cheerful as ever. Don't alarm yourself, lovey, he said. I will climb into a tree, fix the door firmly in a fork, and you can sleep there as safe and comfortable as in your own bed. So he climbed the tree, fixed the door, and Mrs. Vinegar lay down on it, and being dead tired, was soon fast asleep. But her weight tilted the door sideways. So after a time, Mr. Vinegar, being afraid she might slip off, sat down on the other side to balance her and keep watch. Now in the very middle of the night, just as he was beginning to nod. What would happen but that a band of robbers should meet beneath that very tree in order to divide their spoils? Mr. Vinegar could hear every word said quite distinctly and began to tremble like an aspen as he listened to the terrible deeds the thieves had done to gain their ends. Don't shake so, murmured Mrs. Vinegar half asleep. You'll have me off this bed. I'm not shaking, lovey, whispered back Mr. Vinegar in a quaking voice. It's only the wind in the trees. But for all of his cheerfulness, he was not really very brave inside. So he went on trembling and shaking and shaking and trembling, till, just as the robbers were beginning to parcel out the money, he actually shook the door right out of the tree fork, and down it came, with Mrs. Vinegar still asleep upon it right on top of the robbers' heads. So you may imagine, they thought the sky had fallen and made off as fast as their legs would carry them, leaving their booty behind them. But Mr. Vinegar, who had saved himself from the fall by clinging to a branch, was far too frightened to go down in the dark to see what had happened. So up in the tree he sat like a big bird until dawn came. Then Mrs. Vinegar woke rubbed her eyes, yawned, and said, Where am I? On the ground, lovey, answered Mr. Vinegar, scrambling down. And when they lifted up the door, what do you think they found? One robber squashed flat as a pancake, and forty gold guineas all scattered about. My goodness, how Mr. and Mrs. Vinegar jumped for joy. Now, Vinegar, said his wife, when they had gathered up all the gold pieces, I will tell you what we must do. You must go to the next market town and buy a cow. For, see you, money makes the mare to go, truly, but it also goes itself. Now a cow won't run away, but will give us milk and butter, which we can sell. So we shall live in comfort for the rest of our days. What a head you have, lovey, said Mr. Vinegar admiringly, and started off on his errand. Mind you make a good bargain, bawled his wife after him. I always do, bawled back Mr. Vinegar. I made a good bargain when I married such a clever wife, and I made a better one when I shook her down from the tree. I am the happiest man alive. So he trudged on, laughing and jingling the forty gold pieces in his pocket. Now the first thing he saw in the market was an old red cow. I am in luck today, he thought. That is the very beast for me. I shall be the happiest of men if I get that cow. So he went up to the owner, jingling the gold in his pocket. What will you take for your cow? he asked. And the owner of the cow, seeing he was a simpleton, said, What you've got in your pocket? Done, said Mr. Vinegar, handed over the forty guineas and led off the cow, marching her up and down the market, much against her will to show off his bargain. Now, as he drove it about, proud as punch, he noticed a man who was playing the bagpipes. 
He was followed about by a crowd of children who danced to the music, and a perfect shower of pennies fell into his cap every time he held it out. Ho, ho, thought Mr. Vinegar, that is an easier way of earning a livelihood than by driving about a beast of a cow. Then the feeding and the milking and the churning. Ah, I should be the happiest man alive if I had those bagpipes. So he went to the musician and said, what will you take for your bagpipes? Well, replied the musician, seeing he was a simpleton, it is a beautiful instrument and I make so much money by it that I cannot take anything less than that red cow. Done, cried Mr. Vinegar in a hurry, lest the man should repent his offer. So the musician walked off with the red cow, and Mr. Vinegar tried to play the bagpipes. <laughs> but alas, and alack, though he blew until he almost burst, not a sound could he make at first. And when he did at last, it was such a terrific squeal and screech that all the children ran away frightened, and the people stopped their ears. But he went on and on, trying to play a tune, and never earning anything, save hootings and peltings, until his fingers were almost frozen with the cold, when, of course, the noise he made on the bagpipes was worse than ever. Then he noticed a man who had on a pair of warm gloves, and he said to himself, Music is impossible when one's fingers are frozen. I believe I should be the happiest man alive if I had those gloves. So he went up to the owner and said, You seem, sir, to have a very good pair of gloves. And the man replied, Truly, sir, my hands are as warm as toast this bitter November day. That quite decided Mr. Vinegar, and he asked at once what the owner would take for them. And the owner seeing he was a simpleton, said, As your hands seem frozen, sir, I will, as a favor, let you have them for your bagpipes. Done! cried Mr. Vinegar, delighted, and made the exchange. Then he set off to find his wife, quite pleased with himself. Warm hands, warm heart, he thought. I'm the happiest man alive. But as he trudged, he grew very, very tired, and at last began to limp. Then he saw a man coming along the road with a stout stick. I should be the happiest man alive if I had that stick, he thought. What is the use of warm hands if your feet ache? So he said to the man with the stick, What will you take for your stick? And the man, seeing he was a simpleton, replied, Well, I don't want to part with my stick, but as you are so pressing, I'll oblige you as a friend, for those warm gloves you're wearing. Done for you, cried Mr. Vinegar, delighted, and trudged off with the stick, chuckling to himself over his good bargain. But as he went along, a magpie fluttered out of the hedge and sat on a branch in front of him and chuckled and laughed, as magpies do. What are you laughing at? asked Mr. Vinegar. How do you forsooth? <laughs> chuckled the magpie, fluttering just a little further. At you, Mr. Vinegar, <laughs> you foolish man, you simpleton, you blockhead. You bought a cow for forty guineas when she wasn't worth ten. <laughs> and you exchanged her for bagpipes you couldn't play, and changed the bagpipes for a pair of gloves, and a pair of gloves for a miserable stick. So you've got nothing to show for your forty guineas save a stick you might have cut in any hedge. <laughs> you fool, you simpleton, you blockhead. And the magpie chuckled and chuckled and chuckled in such guffaws, fluttering from branch to branch as Mr. Vinegar trudged along, that at last he flew into a violent rage and flung his stick at the bird. And the stick stuck in a tree out of his reach. So he had to go back to his wife without anything at all. But he was glad the stick was stuck in a tree, for Mrs. Vinegar's hands were quite hard enough. When it was all over, Mr. Vinegar said cheerfully, You are too violent, lovey. You broke the pickle jar, and now you've nearly broken every bone in my body. I think we had better turn over a new leaf and begin afresh. I shall take service as a gardener. And you can go as a housemaid until we have enough money to buy a pickle jar. 
there are as good ones in the shop as ever came out of it. And that is the story of Mr. and Mrs. Vinegar. End of chapter 20 Recording by H. R. Craddock Chapter 21 of English Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. English Fairy Tales by Flora Annie Steele. The True History of Sir Thomas Thumb. At the court of great King Arthur, who lived, as all know, when knights were bold and ladies were fair indeed, one of the most renowned of men was the wizard merlin never before or since was there such another all that was to be known of wizardry he knew and his advice was ever good and kindly now once when he was travelling in the guise of a beggar he chanced upon an honest ploughman and his wife who giving him a hearty welcome supplied him cheerfully with a big wooden bowl of fresh milk and some coarse brown bread on a wooden platter still though both they and the little cottage where they dwelt were neat and tidy merlin noticed that neither the husband nor the wife seemed happy and when he asked the cause they said it was because they had no children had i but a son no matter if he were no bigger than my goodman's thumb said the poor woman we should be quite content now this idea of a boy no bigger than a man's thumb so tickled wizard merlin's fancy that he promised straight away that such a son should come in due time to bring the good couple content this done he went off at once to pay a visit to the queen of the fairies since he felt that the little people would best be able to carry out his promise and sure enough the droll fancy of a mannikin no bigger than his father's thumb tickled the fairy queen also and she set about the task at once so behold the ploughman and his wife as happy as king and queen over the tiniest of tiny babies and all the happier because the fairy queen anxious to see the little fellow flew in at the window bringing with her clothes fit for the wee mannikin to wear an oak leaf hat he had for his crown his jacket was woven of thistle down his shirt was a web by spiders spun his breeches of softest feathers were done his stockings of red apple rind were tine with an eyelash plucked from his mother's eyne his shoes were made of a mouse's skin tanned with the soft furry hair within dressed in the skies he looked the prettiest little fellow ever seen and the fairy queen kissed him over and over again and gave him the name of tom thumb now as he grew older though mind you he never grew bigger he was so full of antics and tricks that he was forever getting into trouble once his mother was making a batter pudding and tom wanting to see how it was made climbed up to the edge of the bowl his mother was so busy beating the batter that she didn't notice him and when his foot slipped and he plumped head and ears into the bowl she just went on beating until the batter was light enough then she put it into the pudding cloth and set it on the fire to boil now the batter had so filled poor tom's mouth that he couldn't cry but no sooner did he feel the hot water than he began to struggle and kick so much that the pudding bobbed up and down and jumped about in such strange fashion that the ploughman's wife thought it was bewitched and in a great fright flung it to the door here a poor tinker passing by picked it up and put it in his wallet but by this time tom had got his mouth clear of the batter and he began hollowing and making such a to-do that the tinker even more frightened than tom's mother had been threw the pudding in the road and ran away as fast as he could luckily for tom this second fall broke the pudding string and he was able to creep out all covered with half-cooked batter and make his way home where his mother distressed to see her little dear in such a woeful state put him into a teacup of water to clean him and then tucked him up in bed another time tom's mother went to milk her red cow in the meadow and took tom with her for she was ever afraid lest he should fall into mischief when left alone now the wind was high and fearful lest he should be blown away she tied him to a thistle-head with one of her own long hairs 
and then began to milk but the red cow nosing about for something to do while she was being milked as all cows will spied tom's oak leaf hat and thinking it looked good curled its tongue around the thistle stalk and there was tom dodging the cow's teeth and roaring as loud as he could mother mother help help locks a mercy me cried his mother where's the child got to now where are you you bad boy here roared tom in the red cow's mouth with that his mother began to weep and wail not knowing what else to do and tom hearing her roared louder than ever whereat the red cow alarmed and no wonder at the dreadful noise in her throat opened her mouth and tom dropped out luckily into his mother's apron otherwise he would have been badly hurt falling so far adventures like these were not tom's fault he could not help being so small but he got into dreadful trouble once for which he was entirely to blame this is what happened he loved playing cherry stones with the big boys and when he had lost all his own he would creep unbeknownst into the other players pockets or bags and make off with cherry stones enough and galore to carry on the game now one day it so happened that one of the boys saw master tom on the point of coming out of a bag with a whole fistful of cherry stones so he just drew the string of the bag tight ha ha mr thomas thumb says he jeeringly so you were going to pinch my cherry stones were you well you shall have more of them than you like and with that he gave the cherry stone bag such a hearty shake that all tom's body and legs were sadly bruised black and blue nor was he let out till he had promised never to steal cherry stones again so the years passed and when tom was a lad still no bigger than a thumb his father thought he might begin to make himself useful so he made a whip out of a barley straw and sent him to drive the cattle home but tom in trying to climb a furrow's ridge which to him of course was a steep hill slipped down and lay half stunned so that a raven happening to fly over thought he was a frog and picked him up intending to eat him not relishing the morsel however the bird dropped him above the battlements of a big castle that stood close to the sea now the castle belonged to one grumbo an ill-tempered giant who happened to be taking the air on the roof of his tower and when tom dropped on his bald pate the giant put up his great hand to catch what he thought was an impudent fly and finding something that smelt man's meat he just swallowed the little fellow as he would have swallowed a pill he began however to repent very soon for tom kicked and struggled in the giant's inside as he had done in the red cow's throat until the giant felt quite squeamish and finally got rid of tom by being sick over the battlements into the sea and here doubtless would have been tom thumb's end by drowning had not a big fish thinking that he was a shrimp rushed at him and gulped him down now by good chance some fishermen were standing by with their nets and when they drew them in the fish that had swallowed tom was one of the hall being a very fine fish it was sent to the court kitchen where when the fish was opened out popped tom on the dresser as spry as spry to the astonishment of the cook and the scullions never had such a mite of a man been seen while his quips and pranks kept the whole buttery in roars of laughter what is more he soon became the favorite of the whole court and when the king went out a-riding tom sat in the royal waistcoat pocket ready to amuse royalty and the knights of the round table after a while however tom wearied to see his parents again so the king gave him leave to go home and take with him as much money as he could carry tom therefore chose a threepenny bit and putting it into a purse made of a water bubble lifted it with difficulty on to his back and trudged away to his father's house which was some half a mile distant it took him two days and two nights to cover the ground and he was fair out wearied by his heavy burden ere he reached home however his mother put him to rest in a walnut shell by the fire and gave him a whole hazelnut to eat which sad to say disagreed with him dreadfully however he recovered in some measure but had grown so thin and light that to save him the trouble of walking back to the court his mother tied him to a dandelion clock 
and as there was a high wind away he went as if on wings unfortunately however just as he was flying low in order to alight the court cook an ill-natured fellow was coming across the palace yard with a bowl of hot fermenti for the king's supper now tom was unskilled in the handling of dandelion horses so what should happen but that he rode straight into the fermenti split the half of it and splashed the other half scalding hot into the cook's face he was in a fine rage and going straight to king arthur said that tom at his old antics had done it on purpose now the king's favorite dish was hot fermenti so he also fell into a fine rage and ordered tom to be tried for high treason he was therefore imprisoned in a mouse-trap where he remained for several days tormented by a cat who thinking him some new kind of mouse spent its time in sparring at him through the bars at the end of a week however king arthur having recovered the loss of the fermenti sent for tom and once more received him into favor after this tom's life was happy and successful he became so renowned for his dexterity and wonderful activity that he was knighted by the king under the name of sir thomas thumb and as his clothes what with the batter and the fermenti to say nothing of the insides of giants and fishes had become somewhat shabby his majesty ordered him a new suit of clothes fit for a mounted knight to wear he also gave him a beautiful prancing gray mouse as a charger it was certainly very diverting to see tom dressed up to the nines and as proud as punch of butterflies wings his shirt was made his boots of chicken hide and by a nimble fairy blade all learned in the tailoring trade his coat was well supplied a needle dangled at his side and thus attired in stately pride a dapper mouse he used to ride in truth the king and all the knights of the round table were ready to expire with laughter at tom on his fine curveting steed but one day as the hunt was passing a farmhouse a big cat lurking about made one spring and carried both tom and the mouse up a tree nothing daunted tom boldly drew his needle sword and attacked the enemy with such fierceness that she let her prey fall luckily one of the nobles caught the little fellow in his cap otherwise he must have been killed by the fall and as it was he became very ill and the doctor almost despaired of his life however his friend and guardian the queen of the fairies arrived in a chariot drawn by flying mice and then and there carried tom back with her to fairyland where amongst folk of his own size he after a time recovered but time runs swiftly in fairyland and when tom thumb returned to court he was surprised to find that his father and mother and nearly all his old friends were dead and that king thunston reigned in king arthur's place so every one was astonished at his size and carried him as a curiosity to the audience hall who art thou mannikin asked king thunstone whence dost come and where dost live to which tom replied with a bow my name is well known from the fairies i come when king arthur shone this court was my home by him i was knighted in me he delighted your servant sir thomas thumb this answer so pleased his majesty that he ordered a little golden chair to be made so that tom might sit beside him at table also a little palace of gold but a span high with doors a bare inch wide in which the little fellow might take his ease now king thunstone's queen was a very jealous woman and could not bear to see such honors showered on the little fellow so she up and told the king all sorts of bad tales about his favorite amongst others that he had been saucy and rude to her whereupon the king sent for tom but forewarned is forearmed and knowing by bitter experience the danger of royal displeasure tom hid himself in an empty snail shell where he lay till he was nigh starved then seeing a fine large butterfly on a dandelion close by he climbed up and managed to get astride it no sooner had he gained his seat than the butterfly was off hovering from tree to tree from flower to flower at last the royal gardener saw it and gave chase then the nobles joined in the hunt even the king himself and finally the queen who forgot her anger in the merriment hither and thither they ran trying in vain to catch the pair 
and almost expiring with laughter until poor tom dizzy with so much fluttering and doubling and flittering fell from his seat into a watering-pot where he was nearly drowned so they all agreed he must be forgiven because he had afforded them so much amusement thus tom was once more in favour but he did not live long to enjoy his good luck for a spider one day attacked him and though he fought well the creature's poisonous breath proved too much for him he fell dead on the ground where he stood and the spider soon sucked every drop of his blood thus ended sir thomas thumb but the king and the court were so sorry at the loss of their little favourite that they went into mourning for him and they put a fine white marble monument over his grave whereon was carven the following epitaph here lies tom thumb king arthur's knight who died by a spider's fell despite he was well known in arthur's court where he afforded gallant sport he rode at tilt and tournament and on a mouse a hunting went alive he filled the court with mirth his death to sadness must give birth so wipe your eyes and shake your head and say alas tom thumb is dead End of chapter 21chapter twenty two of english fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c english fairy tales by flora annie steele henny penny one day henny penny was picking up corn in the rickyard when whack an acorn hit her upon the head goodness gracious me said henny penny the sky's a going to fall i must go and tell the king so she went along and she went along and she went along till she met cocky locky where are you going henny penny said cocky locky oh i'm going to tell the king the sky's a falling said henny penny may i come with you says cocky locky certainly says henny penny so henny penny and cocky locky went to tell the king the sky was falling they went along and they went along and they went along till they met ducky daddles where are you going to henny penny and cocky locky says ducky daddles oh we're going to tell the king the sky's a-falling said honey penny and cocky locky may i come with you says ducky daddles certainly said henny penny and cocky locky so henny penny cocky locky and ducky daddles went to tell the king the sky was a-falling so they went along and they went along and they went along till they met goosey poosey where are you going to henny penny cocky locky and ducky daddles said goosey poosey oh we're going to tell the king the sky's a falling said henny penny and cocky locky and ducky daddles may i come with you said goosey poosey certainly said henny penny cocky locky and ducky daddles so henny penny cocky locky ducky daddles and goosey poosey went to tell the king the sky was a-falling so they went along and they went along and they went along till they met turkey lurkey where are you going henny penny cocky locky ducky daddles and goosey poosey said turkey lurkey oh we're going to tell the king the sky's a-falling said henny penny cocky locky ducky daddles and goosey poosey may i come with you henny penny cocky locky ducky daddles and goosey poosey said kirky lurkey oh certainly turkey lurkey said henny penny cocky locky ducky daddles and goosey poosey so henny penny cocky locky ducky daddles goosey poosey and turkey lurkey all went to tell the king the sky was a-falling so they went along and they went along and they went along till they met 
Foxy Woxy, and Foxy Woxy said to Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, and Turkey Lurkey, Where are you going, Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, and Turkey Lurkey? And Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, and Turkey Lurkey said to Foxy Woxy, We're going to tell the king the skies are falling. Oh, but this is not the way to the king, Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, and Turkey Lurkey, said Foxy Woxy. I know the proper way. Shall I show you? Oh, certainly, Foxy Woxy, said Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, and Turkey Lurkey. So Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, Turkey Lurkey, and Foxy Woxy all went to tell the king the sky was a falling. So they went along, and they went along, and they went along, till they came to a narrow and dark hole. Now this was the door of Foxy Woxy's burrow. But Foxy Woxy said to Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, and Turkey Lurkey, This is the shortcut to the king's palace. You'll soon get there if you follow me. I will go first, and you come after Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, and Turkey Lurkey. Why, of course, certainly, without doubt, why not? said Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, and Turkey Lurkey. So Foxy Woxy went into his burrow and didn't go very far but turned around to wait for Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, and Turkey Lurkey. Now Turkey Lurkey was the first to go through the dark hole into the burrow. He hadn't got far when, Hrumph! Foxy Woxy snapped off Turkey Lurkey's head and threw his body over his left shoulder. Then Goosey Poosey went in and, Hrumph! Off went her head and Goosey Poosey was thrown beside Turkey Lurkey. Then Ducky Daddles waddled down and, Hrumph! Foxy Woxy had snapped off Ducky Daddles' head and Ducky Daddles was thrown alongside Turkey Lurkey and Goosey Poosey. Then Cocky Locky strutted down into the burrow and he hadn't gotten far when Hrumph! But Cocky Locky will always crow whether you want him to do so or not, and so he had just time for one cock a doodle before he went to join Turkey Lurkey, Goosey Poosey, and Ducky Daddles over Foxy Woxy's shoulders. Now, when Henny Penny, who had just got into the dark burrow, heard Cocky Locky crow, she said to herself, My goodness, it must be dawn. Time for me to lay my egg. So she turned around and bustled off to her nest. So she escaped, but she never told the king the sky was falling. End of chapter 22 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 23 of English Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Franziska Powell. English Fairy Tales by Flora Annie Steele. The Three Heads of the Well. Once upon a time, there reigned a king in Colchester, valiant, strong, wise, famous as a good ruler. But in the midst of his glory, his dear queen died, leaving him with a daughter just touching woman's estate. And this maiden was renowned far and wide for beauty, kindness, grace. Now strange things happen, and the king of Colchester, hearing of a lady who had immense riches, had a mind to marry her, though she was old, ugly, hook-nosed, and ill-tempered and though she was, furthermore, possessed of a daughter as ugly as herself. None could give the reason why, but only a few weeks after the death of his dear queen, 
the king brought his loathly bride to court and married her with great pomp and festivities now the very first thing she did was to poison the king's mind against his own beautiful kind gracious daughter of whom naturally the ugly queen and her ugly daughter were dreadfully jealous now when the young princess had found that even her father had turned against her she grew weary of court life and longed to get away from it so one day happening to meet the king alone in the garden she went down on her knees and begged and prayed him to give her some help and let her go out into the world to seek her fortune to this the king agreed and told his consort to fit the girl out for her enterprise in proper fashion but the jealous woman only gave her a canvas bag of brown bread and hard cheese with a bottle of small beer though this was but a pitiful dowry for a king's daughter the princess was too proud to complain so she took it returned her thanks and set off on her journey through woods and forests by rivers and lakes over mountains and valley at last she came to a cave at the mouth of which on a stone sat an old old man with a white beard good morrow fair damsel he said whither away so fast reverend father replied she i got to seek my fortune and what hast thou for dowry fair damsel said he in the bag and bottle bread and cheese and small beer father says she smiling will it please you to partake of either with all my heart says he and when she pulled out her provisions he ate them nearly all but once again she made no complaint but bade him eat what he needed and welcome now when he had finished he gave her many thanks and said for your beauty and your kindness and your grace take this wand there is a thick thorny hedge before you which seems impassable but strike it thrice with this wand saying each time please hedge let me through and it will open a pathway for you then when you come to a well sit down on the brink of it and do not be surprised at anything you may see but whatever you are asked to do that do so saying the old man went into the cave and she went on her way after a while she came to a high thick thorny hedge but when she struck it three times with the wand saying please hedge let me through it opened a wide pathway for her so she came to the well on the brink of which she sat down and no sooner had she done so than the golden head without anybody came up through the water singing as it came wash me and comb me lay me on a bank to dry softly and prettily to watch the passers-by certainly she said pulling out her silver comb then placing the head on her lap she began to comb the golden hair when she had combed it she lifted the golden head softly and laid it on a primrose bank to dry no sooner had she done this than another golden head appeared singing as it came wash me and comb me lay me on a bank to dry softly and prettily to watch the passers-by certainly says she and after combing the golden hair placed the golden head softly on the primrose bank beside the first one then came a third head out of the well and it said the same thing wash me and comb me lay me on a bank to dry softly and prettily to watch the passers-by with all my heart says she graciously and after taking the head on her lap and combing its golden hair with her silver comb there were the three golden hats in a row on the primrose bank and she sat down to rest herself and looked at them they were so quaint and pretty and as she rested she cheerfully ate and drank the meagre portion of the brown bread hard cheese and small beer which the old man had left to her for though she was a king's daughter she was too proud to complain then the first head spoke brothers what shall we weird for this damsel who has been so gracious unto us i word her to be so beautiful that she shall charm every one she meets and i said the second head 
weird her a voice that shall exceed the nightingales in sweetness. And I, said a third head, weird her to be so fortunate that she shall marry the greatest king that reigns. Thank you with all my heart, says she, but don't you think I had better put you back in the well before I go on? Remember, you're golden, and the passers-by might steal you. To this they agreed, so she put them back. And when they had thanked her for her kind thought and said goodbye, she went on her journey. Now she had not travelled far before she came to a forest where the king of the country was hunting with his nobles. And as the gay cavalcade passed down the glade, she stood back to avoid them. But the king caught sight of her and drew up his horse, fairly amazed at her beauty. Fair maid, he said. Who art thou, and whither goest thou through the forest thus alone? I am the king of Colchester's daughter, and I go to seek my fortune, says she, and her voice was sweeter than the nightingales. Then the king jumped from his horse, being so struck by her that he felt it would be impossible to live without her, and falling on his knees begged and prayed her to marry him without delay. And he begged and prayed so well that at last she consented. So with all the courtesy, he mounted her on his horse behind him, and commanding the hunt to follow, he returned to his palace, where the wedding festivities took place with all possible pomp and merriment. Then, ordering out the royal chariot, the happy pair started to pay the king of Colchester a bridal visit, and you may imagine the surprise and delight with which, after so short an absence, the people of Colchester saw their beloved, beautiful, kind and gracious princess return in a chariot all gemmed with gold, as the bride of the most powerful king in the world. The bells rang out, flags flew, drums beat, the people hosayed, and all was gladness, save for the ugly queen and her ugly daughter, who were ready to burst with envy and malice. For, see you, the despised maiden was now above them both, and went before them at every court ceremonial. So, after the visit was ended, and the young king and his bride had gone back to their own country, there to live happily ever after, the ugly, ill-natured princess said to her mother, the ugly queen, I also will go into the world and seek my fortune. If that drab of a girl with her mincing ways got so much, what may I not get? So her mother agreed and furnished her forth with silken dress and furs and gave her as provisions sugar, almonds and sweetness of every variety, besides a large flagon of Malaga sack, altogether a right royal dowry. Armed with these, she set forth, following the same road as her stepsister. Thus she soon came upon the old man with a white beard, who was seated on a stone by the mouth of a cave. Good morrow, says he, whither away so fast? What's that to you, old man? she replied rudely. And what hast thou for dowry and bag and bottle? he asked quietly. Good things, with which you shall not be troubled, she answered pertly. Will thou not spare an old man something? he said. Then she laughed, not a bite, not a sup, lest they should choke you, though that would be small matter to me, she replied with a toss of her head. Then ill luck go with thee, remarked the old man as he rose and went into the cave. So she went on her way, and after a time came to the thick thorny hedge, and seeing what she thought was a gap in it, she tried to pass through. But no sooner had she got well into the middle of the hedge than the thorns closed in around her so that she was all scratched and torn before she went her way. Thus streaming with blood, she went on to the well, and seeing water, sat on the brink intending to cleanse herself. But just as she dipped her hands, up came a golden head, singing as it came, Wash me and comb me, lay me on the bank to dry. Softly and prettily to watch the passers by. A likely story, said she. I'm going to wash myself. And with that, she gave the head such a bang with her bottle that it bobbed below the water. But it came up again, 
and so did the second head singing as it came wash me and comb me lay me on the bank to dry softly and prettily to watch the passers-by not i scoffs she i'm going to wash my hands and face and have my dinner so she fetches the second head a cruel bang with a bottle and both heads duck down in the water but when they came up again all draggled and dripping the third head came also singing as it came wash me and comb me lay me on the bank to dry softly and prettily to watch the passers-by by this time the ugly princess has cleansed herself and seated on the primrose bank had her mouth full of sugar and almonds not i says she as well as she could i'm not a washerwoman nor a barber so take that for your washing and combing and with that having finished the malaga sack she flung the empty bottle at her three heads but this time they didn't duck they looked at each other and said how shall we wear this rude girl for her bad manners then the first head said i weird that to her ugliness shall be added blotches on her face and the second head said i weird that she shall ever be hoarse as a cow and speak as if she had her mouth full and the third head said and i weird that she shall be glad to marry a cobbler then the three heads sank into the well and were no more seen and the ugly princess went on her way but lo and behold when she came to a town the children ran from her ugly blotched face screaming with fright and when she tried to tell them that she was the kings of colchester's daughter her voice squeaked like a corn crakes was hoarse as a crow's, and folk could not understand a word she said because she spoke as if her mouth was full now in the town there happened to be a cobbler who not long before had mended the shoes of a poor old hermit and the latter having no money had paid for the job by the gift of a wonderful ointment which would cure blotches on the face and a bottle of medicine that would banish any hoarseness so seeing this miserable ugly princess in great distress he went up to her and gave her a few drops out of his bottle and then understanding from her rich attire and clearer speech that she was indeed the king's daughter he craftily said that if she would take him for a husband he would undertake to cure her anything anything sobbed the miserable princess so they were married and the cobbler straightway set off with his bride to visit the king of colchester but the bells did not ring the drums did not beat and the people instead of hosaying burst into loud guffaws at the cobbler in leather and his wife in silks and satins as for the ugly queen she was so enraged and disappointed that she went mad and hanged herself in wrath whereupon the king really pleased at getting rid of her so soon gave the cobbler a hundred pounds and bade him go about his business with his ugly bride which he did quite contentedly for a hundred pounds means much to a poor cobbler so they went to a remote part of the kingdom and lived unhappily for many years he cobbling shoes and she spinning the thread for him End of the three heads of the well recording by francisca powell chapter twenty four of english fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. English Fairy Tales by Flora Annie Steele Mr. Fox Lady Mary was young, and Lady Mary was fair, and she had more lovers than she could count on the fingers of both hands. She lived with her two brothers, who were very proud and very fond of their beautiful sister and very anxious that she should choose well amongst her many suitors now amongst them there was a certain mr fox handsome and young and rich and though nobody quite knew who he was 
he was so gallant and so gay that every one liked him and he wooed lady mary so well that at last she promised to marry him but though he talked much of the beautiful home to which he would take her and described the castle and all the wonderful things that furnished it he never offered to show it to her neither did he invite lady mary's brothers to see it now this seemed to her very strange indeed and being a lass of spirit she made up her mind to see the castle if she could so one day just before the wedding when she knew mr fox would be away seeing the lawyers with her brothers she just kilted up her skirts and set out unbeknownst for you see the whole household was busy preparing for the marriage feastings to see for herself what mr fox's beautiful castle was like after many searchings and much travelling she found at last and a fine strong building it was with high walls and a deep moat to it a bit frowning and gloomy but when she came up to the wide gateway she saw these words carven over the arch be bold be bold so she plucked up courage and the gate being open went through it and found herself in a wide empty open courtyard at the end of this was a smaller door and over this was carven be bold be bold but not too bold so she went through it to a wide empty hall and up the wide empty staircase now at the top of the staircase there was a wide empty gallery at one end of which were wide windows with the sunlight streaming through them from a beautiful garden and at the other end a narrow door over the archway of which was carven be bold be bold but not too bold lest that your heart's blood should run cold now lady mary was a lass of spirit and so of course she turned her back on the sunshine and opened the narrow dark door and there she was in a narrow dark passage but at the end there was a chink of light so she went forward and put her eye to the chink and what do you think she saw why a wide saloon lit with many candles and all around it some hanging by their necks some seated on chairs some lying on the floor were the skeletons and bodies of numbers of beautiful young maidens in their wedding dresses that were all stained with blood now lady mary for all she was alas a spirit and brave as brave could not look for long on such a horrid sight so she turned and fled down the dark narrow passage through the dark narrow door which she did not forget to close behind her and along the wide gallery she fled like a hare and was just going down the wide stairs into the wide hall when what did she see through the window but mr fox dragging a beautiful young lady across the wide courtyard there was nothing for it lady mary decided but to hide herself as quickly and as best she might so she fled faster down the wide stairs and hid herself behind a big wine butt that stood in a corner of the wide hall she was only just in time for there at the wide door was mr fox dragging the poor young maiden along by the hair and he dragged her across the wide hall and up the wide stairs and when she clutched at the banisters to stop herself mr fox cursed and swore dreadfully and at last he drew his sword and brought it down so hard on the poor young lady's wrist that the hand cut off jumped up into the air so that the diamond ring on the finger flashed in the sunlight as it fell all the places in the world into lady mary's very lap 
as she crouched behind the wine butt. Then she was fair frightened, thinking Mr. Fox would be sure to find her, but after looking about a little while in vain, of course, he coveted the diamond ring, he continued his dreadful task of dragging the poor, beautiful young maiden upstairs to the horrid chamber, intending, doubtless, to return when he had finished his loathly work and seek for the hand. But by that time Lady Mary had fled. No sooner did she hear the awful dragging noise pass into the gallery than she upped and ran for dear life through the wide door with be bold be bold but not too bold engraven over the arch across the wide courtyard past the wide gate with be bold be bold engraven over it never stopping never thinking till she reached her own chamber and all the while the hand with the diamond ring lay in her kilted lap now the very next day when mr fox and lady mary's brothers returned from the lawyers the marriage contract had to be signed and all the neighborhood was asked to witness it and partake of a splendid breakfast and there was lady mary in bridal array and there was mr fox looking so gay and so gallant he was seated at the table just opposite lady mary and he looked at her and said, How pale you are this morning, dear heart. Then Lady Mary looked at him quietly and said, Yes, dear sir, I had a bad night's rest, for I had horrible dreams. Then Mr. Fox smiled and said, Dreams go by contraries, dear heart, but tell me your dream, and your sweet voice will speed the time till I can call you mine. I dreamed, said Lady Mary, with a quiet smile, and her eyes were clear, that I went yesterday to seek the castle that is to be my home, and I found it in the woods, with high walls and a deep dark moat, and over the gateway were carven these words, Be bold, be bold. Then Mr. Fox spoke in a hurry, But it is not so, nor it was not so. Then I crossed the wide courtyard and went through a wide door over which was carven, Be bold, be bold, but not too bold, went on Lady Mary, still smiling, and her voice was cold. But of course it is not so, and it was not so. And Mr. Fox said nothing. He sat like a stone. Then I dreamed, continued Lady Mary, still smiling, though her eyes were stern, that I passed through a wide hall and up a wide stair and along a wide gallery until I came to a dark narrow door, and over it was carven, Be bold, be bold, but not too bold, lest that your heart's blood should run cold. But it is not so, of course, and it was not so. And Mr. Fox said nothing. He sat frozen. Then I dreamed that I opened the door and went down a dark narrow passage, said Lady Mary, still smiling, though her voice was ice. And at the end of the passage there was a door, and the door had a chink in it. And through the chink I saw a wide saloon lit with many candles, and all around it were the bones and bodies of poor dead maidens their clothes all stained with blood, but of course it is not so, and it was not so. By this time all the neighbors were looking Mr. Fox ways with all their w eyes, while he sat silent. But Lady Mary went on, and her smiling lips were set. Then I dreamed that I ran downstairs, and I had just time to hide myself when you, Mr. Fox, came in dragging a young lady by the hair, and the sunlight glittered on her diamond ring as she clutched the stair rail, and you, out with your sword, cut off the poor lady's hand. Then Mr. Fox rose in his seat stonily, 
and glared about him as if to escape, and his eye-teeth showed like a fox beset by the dogs, and he grew pale, and he said, trying to smile, though his whispering voice could scarcely be heard, But it is not so, dear heart, and it was not so, and God forbid it should be so. Then Lady Mary rose in her seat also, and the smile left her face, and her voice rang as she cried, But it is so, and it was so, here's hand and ring I have to show. And with that she pulled out the poor dead hand with the glittering ring from her bosom, and pointed it straight at Mr. Fox. At this all the company rose, and drawing their swords, cut Mr. Fox to pieces, and served him very well right. End of chapter 24 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 25 of English Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy McCracken. English Fairy Tales by Flora Annie Steele. Dick Whittington and His Cat. More than 500 years ago, there was a little boy named Dick Whittington, and this is true. His father and mother died when he was too young to work, and so poor little Dick was very badly off. He was quite glad to get the parings of the potatoes to eat, and a dry crust of bread now and then, and more than that he did not often get, for the village where he lived was a very poor one, and the neighbors were not able to spare him much. Now the country folk in those days thought that the people of London were all fine ladies and gentlemen, and that there was singing and dancing all the day long, and so rich were they there that even the streets, they said, were paved with gold. Dick used to sit by and listen while all these strange tales of the wealth of London were told, and it made him long to go and live there and have plenty to eat and fine clothes to wear, instead of the rags and hard fare that fell to his lot in the country. So one day, when a great wagon with eight horses stopped on its way through the village, Dick made friends with the wagoner and begged to be taken with him to London. The man felt sorry for poor little Dick when he heard that he had no father or mother to take care of him, and saw how ragged and how badly in need of help he was. So he agreed to take him, and off they set. How far it was, and how many days they took over the journey, I do not know. But in due time Dick found himself in the wonderful city which he had heard so much of, and pictured to himself so grandly. But, oh, how disappointed he was when he got there! How dirty it was! and the people how unlike the gay company with music and singing that he had dreamt of. He wandered up and down the streets, one after another, until he was tired out, but not one did he find that was paved with gold. Dirt and plenty he could see, but none of the gold that he thought to have put in his pockets as fast as he chose to pick it up. Little Dick ran about till he was tired and it was growing dark, and at last he sat himself down in a corner and fell asleep. When morning came, he was very cold and hungry, and though he asked everyone he met to help him, only one or two gave him a halfpenny to buy some bread. For two or three days he lived in the streets in this way, only just able to keep himself alive, when he managed to get some work to do in a hayfield, and that kept him for a short time longer, till the haymaking was over. After this he was as badly off as ever, and did not know where to turn. One day in his wanderings he lay down to rest in the doorway of the house of a rich merchant whose name was Fitzwarren. But here he was soon seen by the cookmaid, who was an unkind, bad-tempered woman, and she cried out to him to be off. Lazy rogue, she called him, and she said she'd precious quick throw some dirty dishwater over him, boiling hot, if he didn't go. However, just then Mr. Fitzwarren himself came home to dinner, and when he saw what was happening he asked dick why he was lying there you're old enough to be at work my boy he said i'm afraid you have a mind to be lazy indeed sir said dick to him indeed that is not so and he told him how hard he had tried to get work to do and how ill he was for want of food dick poor fellow was now so weak that though he tried to stand he had to lie down again 
for it was more than three days since he had anything to eat at all. The kind merchant gave orders for him to be taken into the house, and gave him a good dinner, and then he said that he was to be kept, to do what work he could to help the cook. And now Dick would have been happy enough in his good family if it had not been for the ill-natured cook, who did her best to make life a burden to him. Night and morning she was ever scolding him. Nothing he did was good enough. It was, look sharp here, and hurry up there, and there was no pleasing her. And many's the beating he had from the broomstick or the ladle, or whatever else she had in her hand. At last it came to the ears of Miss Alice, Mr. Fitzwarren's daughter, how badly the cook was treating poor Dick, and she told the cook that she would quickly lose her place if she didn't treat him more kindly, for Dick had become quite a favorite with the family. After that the cook's behavior was a little better, but Dick still had another hardship that he bore with difficulty, for he slept in a garret where were so many holes in the walls and the floor that every night as he lay in bed the room was overrun with rats and mice, and sometimes he could hardly sleep a wink. One day, when he had earned a penny for cleaning a gentleman's shoes, he met a little girl with a cat in her arms, and asked whether she would not sell it to him. Yes, she would, she said, though the cat was such a good mouser that she was sorry to part with her. This just suited Dick, who kept Pussy up in his garret, feeding her on scraps of his own dinner that he saved for her every day. In a little while he had no more bother with the rats and mice. Puss soon saw to that, and he slept sound every night. Soon after this Mr. Fitzwarren had a ship ready to sail, and as it was his custom that all his servants should be given a chance of good fortune as well as himself, he called them all into his counting-house, and asked them what they would send out. They all had something that they were willing to venture except poor Dick, who had neither money nor goods, and so could send nothing. For this reason he did not come into the room with the rest. But Miss Alice guessed what was the matter, and ordered him to be called in. She then said, I will lay down some money for him out of my own purse. But her father told her that would not do, for it must be something of his own. When Dick heard this, he said, I have nothing whatever but a cat, which I bought for a penny some time ago. Go, my boy, fetch your cat then, said his master, and let her go. Dick went upstairs and fetched poor Puss, but there were tears in his eyes when he gave her to the captain. For, he said, I shall now be kept awake all night by the rats and mice. All the company laughed at Dick's odd venture, and Miss Alice, who felt sorry for him, gave him some money to buy another cat. Now this, and other marks of kindness shown him by Miss Alice, made the ill-tempered cook jealous of poor Dick, and she began to use him more cruelly than ever, and was always making game of him for sending his cat to sea. What do you think your cat will sell for? she'd ask. "'as much money as would buy a stick to beat you with.' "'At last poor Dick could not bear this usage any longer, "'and he thought he would run away. "'So he made a bundle of his things. "'He hadn't many, "'and started very early in the morning "'on All Hallows' Day, the first of November. "'He walked as far as Holloway, "'and there he sat down to rest on a stone, "'which to this day, they say, "'is called Whittington's Stone, "'and began to wonder to himself "'which road he should take.' While he was thinking what he should do, the bells of Bow Church and Cheapside began to chime, and as they rang he fancied that they were singing over and over again, "'Turn again, Whittington, Lord Mayor of London!' "'Lord Mayor of London,' said he to himself. "'Why, to be sure, wouldn't I put up with almost anything now to be Lord Mayor of London, and ride in a fine coach when I grow to be a man? Well, I'll go back, and think nothing of the cuffing and scolding of the cross old cook, if I am to be the Lord Mayor of London at last. So back he went, and he was lucky enough to get into the house, and set about his work before the cook came down. But now you must hear what befell Mrs. Puss all this while. The ship unicorn that she was on was a long time at sea, and the cat made herself useful, as she would, among the unwelcome rats that lived on board, too. At last the ship put into harbour on the coast of Barbary, where the only people are the Moors. They had never before seen a ship from England, and flocked in numbers to see the sailors, whose different color and foreign dress were a great wonder to them. They were soon eager to buy the goods with which the ship was laden, and patterns were sent ashore for the king to see. He was so much pleased with them that he sent for the captain to come to the palace, and honored him with an invitation to dinner. But no sooner were they seated, as is the custom there, on the fine rugs and carpets that covered the floor, 
then great numbers of rats and mice came scampering in, swarming all the dishes, and helping themselves from all the good things there were to eat. The captain was amazed, and wondered whether they didn't find such a pest most unpleasant. "'Oh, yes,' said they, "'it was so. "'Oh, yes,' said they, "'it was so, and the king would give half his treasure to be freed of them, "'for they not only spoil his dinner, but they even attack him in his bed at night.' so that a watch has to be kept while he is sleeping for fear of them. The captain was overjoyed. He thought at once of poor Dick Whittington and his cat, and he said he had a creature on board ship that would soon do for all these vermin if she were there. Of course, when the king heard of this, he was eager to possess this wonderful animal. Bring it to me at once, he said, for the vermin are dreadful, and if only it will do what you say, I will load your ship with gold and jewels in exchange for it. The captain, who knew his business, took care not to underrate the value of Dick's cat. He told his majesty how inconvenient it would be to part with her, as when she was gone the rats might destroy the goods in the ship. However, to oblige the king, he would fetch her. "'Oh, make haste, do,' cried the queen. "'I, too, am all impatience to see this dear creature.' Off went the captain, while another dinner was got ready. He took Puss under his arm and got back to the palace just in time to see the carpet covered with rats and mice once again. When Puss saw them, she didn't wait to be told, but jumped out of the captain's arms, and in no time almost all the rats and mice were dead at her feet, while the rest of them had scuttled off to their holes in fright. The king was delighted to get rid so easily of such an intolerable plague, and the queen desired that the animal who had done them such a service might be brought to her upon which the captain called out, "'Puss! Puss! Puss!' and she came running to him. Then he presented her to the queen, who was rather afraid at first to touch a creature who had made such a havoc with her claws. However, when the captain called her, "'Pussy, pussy!' and began to stroke her, the queen also ventured to touch her, and cried, "'Putty, putty!' in imitation of the captain, for she hadn't learned to speak English. He then put her on the queen's lap, where she purred and played with her majesty's hand, and was soon asleep. The king, having seen what Mrs. Puss could do, and learning that her kittens would soon stock the whole country, and keep it free from rats, after bargaining with the captain for the whole ship's cargo, then gave him ten times as much for the cat as all the rest amounted to. The captain then said farewell to the court of Barbary, and after a fair voyage reached London again, with his precious load of gold and jewels, safe and sound. One morning early Mr. Fitzwarren had just come to his counting-house, and settled himself at the desk to count the cash, when there came a knock at the door. "'Who's there?' said he. "'A friend,' replied a voice. "'I come with good news of your ship, the Unicorn.' The merchant in haste opened the door, and who were there but the ship's captain and the mate, bring a chest of jewels and a bill of lading. When he had looked this over, he lifted his eyes and thanked heaven for sending him such a prosperous voyage. The honest captain next told him all about the cat, and showed him the rich present the king had sent for her to poor Dick. Rejoicing on behalf of Dick as much as he had done over his own good fortune, he called out to his servants to come and to bring up Dick. "'Go fetch him, and we'll tell him of his fame. Pray call him Mr. Whittington by name.' The servants, some of them, hesitated at this, and said so great a treasure was too much for a lad like Dick. But Mr. Fitzwarren now showed himself the good man that he was, and refused to deprive him of the value of a single penny. God forbid, he cried, it's all his own, and he shall have it to a farthing. He then sent for Dick, who at that moment was scouring pots for the cook and was black with dirt. He tried to excuse himself from coming into the room in such a plight, but the merchant made him come, and had a chair set for him. And then he began to think they must be making game of him, so he begged them not to play tricks on a poor simple boy, but to let him go downstairs again back to his work in the scullery. "'Indeed, Mr. Whittington,' said the merchant, "'we are all quite in earnest with you, and I most heartily rejoice at the news that these gentlemen have brought, for the captain has sold your cat to the King of Barbary.' and brings you in return for her more riches than I possess in the whole world, and may you long enjoy them. Mr. Fitzwarren then told the men to open the great treasure they had brought with them, saying, There is nothing more now for Mr. Whittington to do but to put it in some place of safety. Poor Dick hardly knew how to behave himself joy. He begged his master to take what part of it he pleased, 
since he owed it to all his kindness. No, no, answered Mr. Fitzwarren, this all belongs to you, and I have no doubt that you will use it well. Dick next begged his mistress, and then Miss Alice, to accept a part of his good fortune, but they would not, and at the same time told him what great joy they felt at his great success. But he was far too kind-hearted to keep it all to himself, so he made a present to the captain, the mate, and the rest of Mr. Fitzwarren's servants, and even to his old enemy, the cross cook. After this, Mr. Fitzwarren advised him to send for a tailor, and get himself dressed like a gentleman, and told him he was welcome to live in his house till he could provide himself with a better. When Whittington's face was washed and his hair curled, and he was dressed in a smart suit of clothes, he was just as handsome and fine a young man as any who visited at Mr. Fitzwarren's, and so thought fair Alice Fitzwarren, who had once been so kind to him and looked upon him with pity. And now she felt he was quite fit to be her sweetheart, and none the less, no doubt, because Whittington was always thinking what he could do to please her, and making her the prettiest presents that could be. Mr. Fitzwarren soon saw which way the wind blew, and ere long proposed to join them in marriage, and to this they both readily agreed. A day for the wedding was soon fixed, and they were attended to church by the Lord Mayor, the Court of Aldermen, the Sheriffs, and a great number of the richest merchants in London, whom they afterwards treated with a magnificent feast. History tells us that Mr. Whittington and his lady lived in great splendor and were very happy. They had several children. He was sheriff and thrice Lord Mayor of London, and received the honor of knighthood from Henry V. After the King's conquest of France, Sir Richard Whittington entertained him and the Queen at dinner at the mansion house, in so sumptuous a manner that the King said, Never had a prince such a subject, to which Sir Richard replied, never had a subject such a prince. End of Dick Whittington and His Cat Recording by Amy McCracken